Y'all can relax and have a seat if you want.
on DOD's fiscal uh, 2021 budget request for missile defense programs. Before I welcome the witnesses, I'd like to note that this will be the final hearing for uh, two people. One is our wonderful staffer, actually the minority staffer, Sarah Minero, who's done a superb job over her tenure here, and we, she will be sorely missed. Uh, also, it's my understanding that Christina Chaplin will maybe only be appearing one more time, but she's done a great job with GAO, so we're deeply appreciative for both of your services. Uh, the witnesses today are General O'Shaughnessy, Vice Admiral Hill, Lieutenant General Carbler, Dr. Sufer, and Ms. Chaplin. Thank you all for participating. Um, there are many things I could go into. I'll just ask unanimous consent that my statement be inserted for the record and then turn to Mr. Uh, Turner, the ranking member, for his remarks. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, too, I want to thank Sarah for all of her uh, hard work and dedication. Um, it, uh, it has been uh, wonderful to work with her, and um, what's been exciting, I think, has not just been her work for all of the members, but really all of the agencies and all of the organizations that interface with our committee has always given you incredibly high marks and has appreciated uh, your professionalism and, and your substantive knowledge. Uh, Mr. Chairman, um, the, um, this year has been marked by tremendous success and disappointment across the missile defense enterprise. In March of 2019, the department successfully conducted its first ground-based intercept of a complex threat representative salvo launch. As part of that test, MDA also used their space-based kill assessment system to confirm the in intercept. They fused data at their C2 BMC system and then it did it again with a second interceptor. It was an impressive feat. Even you, Mr. Chaplin, Ms. Chaplin, acknowledged that it may be the most challenging test in the program's near 30-year history. Unfortunately, just a few months later, in August of 2019, the Department of Defense terminated the redesigned kill vehicle program, which was supposed to address reliability issues in our existing fleet of interceptors. That cancellation incurred $1.2 billion worth of sunk cost and declared a 10-year delay in a critically needed upgrade to our homeland missile defense capabilities. Perhaps the most disappointing part of this cancellation is that the failures leading to this action, both on the contractor and the government side, have eroded our confidence in the agency. The President's budget request for FY21 across the missile defense and missile defeat enterprise totals $20.3 billion. The majority of that money is for the missile defense agency, which represents $9.2 billion, $7.9 billion in regional and strategic missile defense capabilities across the services and the DOD, and $3.2 billion in left of launch activities. While $20.3 billion is an admirable amount, Missile Defense still managed to take significant cuts to their program this year. Notably, this year's budget cancels the Homeland Defense Radar, Hawaii, and the Pacific Radar. It zeroed out all funding of high-powered lasers for unique missile defense requirements. It zeroed out MDA's budget of hypersonic and ballistic space sensors and reallocated it somewhere in the Space Development Agency. These kinds of budget choices indicate a significant lack of judgment in determining which requirements are being pursued in our missile defense enterprise. Coupled with the acquisition failure of the RKV, I remain skeptical of the near-term programmatic direction of missile defense. While I anticipate significant challenges in the direction, priority, and scope of this year's missile defense budget request, there are some opportunities that I do fully support. This year's budget request includes $206.8 million for hypersonic defense. It's a time of great power competition with the Russians fielding strategic hypersonic weapons and the Chinese developing regional hypersonic weapons. We need to actively develop the capacity to defend ourselves from these threats. With this year's budget request, the Aegis Ballistic Missile Defense Fleet will grow to 48 deployable ships to provide forward deployed regional missile defense in support of partners and allies. The FY21 budget request includes $495 million for the procurement of THAAD interceptors. By FY21, the THAAD program will have delivered seven THAAD batteries and 351 interceptors, which have deployed globally to support our troops, partners, and allies. Lastly, the budget request attempts to address the problems caused by the cancellation of RKV. It funds the next generation interceptor, which is meant to be an all up round replacement for GBI. There is still a lot of programmatic and requirements based uncertainty about that program. General O'Shaughnessy, I look forward to hearing your testimony on the requirements for the system. And Admiral Hill, I want to hear how you will balance those requirements with an acquisition strategy that produces capability for this nation 
within a reasonable time frame. From all of our witnesses, I'm interested in your perspectives on how the DOD will provide Congress the ability to perform its oversight responsibilities rigorously. This budget also funds the Department's new architectural approach to filling the gap in homeland missile defense capabilities caused by RKV cancellation by an approach called underlayer. This idea <clears throat> to use modified Aegis and THAAD systems to augment homeland missile defense capabilities where feas feasible. MDA's FY21 budget request asks for $39.2 million for exploring the possibility of modifying the Aegis weapon system for layered homeland defense. MDAA also requested $139 million to develop an extended range THAAD. It is my sincere hope that these capabilities can rapidly be developed and fielded to help address the very real capability gaps we will experience in our homeland missile defense system in near to midterm. This year's missile defense budget is important, not only because of what it chooses to fund, but also what it chooses to zero out. It serves as a testament to the policies and priorities of the Department of Defense. While I've always been a strong supporter of this mission, I have deep and justified skepticisms of the program's direction, transparency, and accountability of the current enterprise. To all the witnesses, thank you for being with us today. I look forward to your testimony and continued dialogue on these critically important issues. I thank the gentleman. I'd now I'd like to ask unanimous consent that non-subcommittee members like Ms. Stefanik be able to ask questions as well. And then I would like to ask unanimous consent that the written testimony of all the witnesses be inserted for the record. And we would ask you to do a five-minute summary of your written testimony. So without further ado, General O'Shaughnessy. Well, thank you. And Chairman Cooper, Ranking Member Turner, and distinguished members of the committee, I'm truly honored to be here today as the commander of U.S. Northern Command, as well as the North American Aerospace Defense Command. And I'm also pleased to testify alongside Dr. Sufer, Admiral Hill, General Carbor, and Ms. Chaplin. And thank you for allowing us to submit our uh, written testimony for the record, sir. And U.S. NORTHCOM and NORAD are charged with executing the national defense strategy's number one objective, defend the homeland. Our adversaries have watched, they've learned, they've invested to offset our strengths while exploiting our weaknesses. They've demonstrated patterns of behavior that indicate their capability, their capacity, and their intent to hold the homeland at risk below the nuclear threshold. And the changing security environment makes it clear that the Arctic is no longer a wall, the oceans are no longer protective moats, they are now avenues of approach to our great homeland. And this highlights the increase in our adversaries' presence in the Arctic as well. To meet this challenge, we need to invest in a capable and persistent defense that can deter adversaries, protect our critical infrastructure, enable power projection forward, and prevent homeland vulnerabilities from being exploited. To deter, detect, and defeat the threats arrayed against our homeland today, U.S. NORTHCOM and NORAD are transforming our commands and our way of thinking. We cannot defend the nation against 21st century threats with 20th century technology. We must be able to outpace our adversaries using a layered defense infused with our latest technology. To do so and secure our competitive military advantage, we will continue to partner with our nation's defense and commercial industry to transform rapidly evolving science into leading edge digital age technology. The strategic homeland integrated ecosystem for layer defense or what we're calling SHIELD is the architecture we need to defend our homeland against adversary threats. As such, our layer defense needs to establish awareness in all domains from below the oceans to the highest level of space, including the unseen cyber domain, which are all at risk. We need a layered sensing grid with ground-based interceptor now and next generation interceptor in the future as well as an underlayer lined with sensors that deliver domain awareness and the command and control systems that drive engagements long before approaching our sovereign territory. We need the ability to deploy defeat mechanisms capable of neutralizing advanced weapon systems in order to defend the homeland. We have put great effort into these areas, such as the ballistic missile defense, along with the need to aggressively defeat additional threats to include the ever-growing cyber and cruise missile threats. Next generation interceptor, Underlayer and a layered homeland defense architecture will give us the capability we need to counter tomorrow's ballistic missile threat. We work closely with the Missile Defense Agency to identify and incorporate trade space and bring the timeline left. The Joint Requirements Oversight Council met earlier this week to discuss all aspects of the program and everyone in the department is shoulder to shoulder with the plan to proceed to include time as a key factor. The pending release of the NGI request for proposal will look to further incentivize industry 
to deliver this capability to the warfighter as soon as possible. We're also addressing another priority, to achieve synergy between ballistic missile defense and cruise missile defense. This will allow us to take advantage of inherent capabilities that can apply to both efforts and open up opportunities for smarter funding and technical decisions across both programs. We are mindful of the gravity of our mission and the trust you have placed in us. Aligned with the NDS and capturing our sense of urgency, we at U.S. North Common NORAD have declared 2020 as a year of Homeland Defense and are moving forward with the implementation of SHIELD. You and the committee should have great faith in the men and women at U.S. NORTHCOM and NORAD because together we have the watch. Thank you for your support and I look forward to your questions. Thank you, General. Now Vice Admiral Hill. <coughs> Chairman Cooper, Ranking Member Turner, and distinguished members of the subcommittee, thank you for your continued strong support for the missile defense mission. I welcome this opportunity to testify before you today side by side with the warfighter, policy, and GAO. The Missile Defense Agency continues to deliver missile defense capability and capacity to the warfighter while supporting warfighter readiness to defend our homeland, four deployed forces, allies and partners against existing and emerging threats. I'm happy to report this past year, we advanced the missile defense program on several fronts. And as you know, and as mentioned earlier, one year ago, our homeland missile defense system, the ground-based mid-course defense, passed a significant milestone when we successfully executed the first salvo intercept flight test against a threat representative intercontinental ballistic missile with countermeasures. We successfully intercepted the re-entry vehicle with a lead ground-based interceptor and the next most lethal object with the trail interceptor. Following integration testing later this year, we were preparing for initial fielding of the long-range discrimination radar in 2021. The LRDR in Clear Alaska is our most advanced ground-based radar, and once operational, it will provide a persistent tracking and discrimination capability to improve defense of the homeland against long-range ballistic missiles. We're making progress on the Aegis Ashore Poland site. However, significant work does remain to complete military construction activities before we can, to be, before we can begin installing the Aegis weapon system. Completion of this work will delay NATO acceptance to no earlier than 2022. In close coordination with the Army Corps of Engineers, we recently implemented additional contractual measures to guide the prime construction contractor towards completion of prioritized tasks. MDA and the Corps are working closely with European Command to minimize the operational impact of the Poland site delay by accelerating the upgrade of the Aegis Ashore Romania site, operational today, to support SM3 Block 2A op operations, which is now complete. Today's operational missile defense system meets the current threat. We will continue to increase the readiness as well as the capability and capacity of fielded homeland and regional missile defense systems while investing in advanced technology to counter adversary ballistic and non-ballistic missile threats. When I fleeted up as the director last June, it was clear that a major reorganization of the agency and realignment of talent was required. It remains a priority for me to structure the agency to increase responsiveness, speed, and efficiency in the increasingly complex all-domain threat environment. We intend to improve business practices, resource stewardship, and talent management. There is more work to be done, but we are on solid ground. This new organization is postured to take on the development, engineering, testing, and delivery of the next generation interceptor, or the NGI. We are leveraging investments made in both the RKV and MOKV programs to begin development of this new Homeland Defense Interceptor. We are working closely with the intelligence community and combatant commands to finalize the right set of requirements for NGI to counter projected threat evolutions. General O'Shaughnessy mentioned we completed the JROC this week, and that is a positive move forward. The department plans to award two competitive NGI development efforts this year. Now, based on the government's 75% confidence schedule, we anticipate in placing the first NGI all up round after sufficient intercept testing as early as 2028. Now, NGI represents significant investment, time, and effort but is the first holistic assessment of all warfighter top level and technical requirements the department has conducted since the initial system operations began in 2004. This will work to ensure NGI paces the threat for years to come. Now working closely with Strategic Command, Northern Command, and Indo-Pacific Command, we're also undertaking architectural work and advanced technology development needed to support hypersonic missile defense and cruise missile defense of the homeland. A critical part of this ar architecture is a persistent space-based global sensor capability to provide full track custody supporting fire control engagements. We are also pursuing advances in joint all-domain and global command and control to support Northern Command in countering cruise missiles. Finally, MBA is investing the development of a layered homeland defense capability by adding sensors and modifying the Aegis weapon system, the SM3 Block 2A missile and the THAAD weapon system, and communications command and control. Later this year, we will conduct the first Aegis SM3 Block 2A intercept of a simple ICBM. We are also assessing upgrades to the THAAD interceptor for testing against an ICBM. I want to emphasize 
that these regional missile defense systems are not replacements for the long-range missile defense capability provided by GMD. However, these capabilities within a layered homeland defense architecture provides flexibility and options for the nation to increase the effectiveness of our defenses. Thank you, and I look forward to answering the committee's questions. Thank you, Admiral. Now, uh, Lieutenant General Carbler. Chairman Cooper, Ranking Member Turner, and distinguished members of the subcommittee, I'm honored to testify before you today. Thank you for supporting our service members, our civilians, contractors, and their families and your continued to support to Army Air and Missile Defense. I am here today as the Army's proponent for air and missile defense, its forces and capabilities, and as the commanding general responsible for the soldiers who stand ready to defend our nation from an intercontinental ballistic missile attack, as well as the soldiers who provide critical missile warning to Army and joint warfighters. As air and missile threats become more diverse and numerous from competitors worldwide, the Army Air and Missile Defense Enterprise is working hard to ensure our warfighters and our homeland are protected. Air and Missile Defense is one of the Army's six modernization priorities, and the Army continues to accelerate delivery of capabilities and capacity as outlined in the Enterprise Framework for Modernization, Army Air and Missile Defense 2028. For example, the first five prototype systems of interim mobile short-range air defense are in government testing. And per the fiscal year 2019 National Defense Authorization Act, the Army selected Iron Dome as the indirect fire protection capabilities interim cruise missile defense solution. We also continue to explore high energy lasers, which have great potential as a low cost, effective complement to kinetic energy to counter rockets, artillery, mortars, cruise missiles, and unmanned aircraft systems. The Army continues to press towards interoperability among sensors and shooters, as well as further integrating space capabilities into multi-domain operations. Critically important systems include the Army's five TIPI-2 forward base mode radars and four joint tactical ground stations providing missile warning from space-based sensors. In all of its air and missile defense missions, the Army seeks a balance of capabilities, both offensive and defensive, to counter threats left of launch and throughout all phases of flight, in any weather, in a denied, degraded, or contested environment. Finally, let me emphasize that people are our greatest strength. The dedicated service members, civilians, and contractors who develop, deploy, and operate our nation's air and missile defense systems, as well as their families who are just as much a part of our team. The con continued support of Congress is critical to our ability to develop and retain our highly qualified and mission-ready team. I look forward to addressing your questions. Thank you. Thank you, General. Dr. Sufer. Chairman Cooper, Ranking Member Turner, and distinguished members of the Strategic Forces Subcommittee, thank you for the opportunity to testify on U.S. missile defense plans and programs in support of the fiscal year 2021 budget request. United States missile defense policy supports the national defense strategy, is driven by the evolving missile threat, and continues to be guided by the 2019 Missile Defense Review. Our nation's first priority remains defense of the homeland against rogue nation ICBM threats, while we rely on nuclear deterrence to address the more numerous and complex nuclear threats posed by China and Russia. To pace the North Korean ICBM threat, the administration has announced the fielding of an additional 20 ground-based interceptors for the protection of the homeland. I will say more about this in a moment. Our second priority is to provide missile defense protection for our deployed forces and allies against increasingly complex regional missile threats. Integrated air and missile defenses support our freedom of maneuver and ensure the United States can reinforce allies and coalition partners during times of crisis and conflict, which serves to deter conflict at the outset. We continue to prioritize cooperation with allies and partners, some of which have come under missile attacks recently. Finally, we seek to hedge against evolving missile threats and unexpected adversary developments by investing in advanced missile defense technology, the most important of which is space-based sensors for tracking. Recent changes in the Department of Defense plans to field an additional 20 ground-based interceptors for the defense of the homeland have been of keen interest to the subcommittee. Like General O'Shaughnessy, OSD policy leadership is concerned with the resulting delay but concur with the chosen course of action as the best means to address the rogue state missile threat as it evolves. The specific concern is that such delay could create security risks for the United States should the North Korean ICBM threat mature faster 
that we can field new ground-based interceptors. This is a difficult judgment to make because while we are well protected today, there is uncertainty about how quickly the threat will evolve. In this regard, the Department is taking a number of steps to move towards a more effective layered approach to Homeland Defense. As you've heard, we are improving the reliability of the existing GMD system through a service life extension program. We're fielding additional advanced discrimination radar in Alaska, developing a new space-based system to track more sophisticated missiles such as hypersonics, and exploring options for a layered homeland missile defense capability which could be available mid-decade and would complement the fielding of the next generation interceptor planned for the end of the decade. Building out this layered architecture <coughs> combined with strike operations to combine, I'm sorry, building out this layered architecture combined with strike operations to counter mobile missiles prior to launch once deterrence fails provides a prudent strategic approach to defeating missile attacks against the United States from rogue states over the decade. I look forward to your questions uh, and I thank you for your, for your time. Thank you, Doctor. Ms. Chaplin. Chairman Cooper, Ranking Member Turner, and members of the subcommittee, thank you for asking me to discuss the GAO's findings and recommendations on the Missile Defense Agency's acquisition practices. In the 16 years that we have been mandated to review MDA's progress, we have considered its acquisition programs to be high risk. This is partly due to the sheer technical, design, and engineering challenge of developing an integrated ballistic missile defense system, but also due to the schedule pressures MDA faces, the changing nature of the threat, and practices that exacerbate the risks already inherent in the mission. These high-risk practices have included too much overlapping of acquisition activities, which we refer to as concurrency. Very simply, this might mean beginning to fabricate systems before designs are fully known, or going into production before completing flight testing. While concurrency can help speed up the acquisition process, it also means that problems come with greater consequences. In the past, we've also found that MDA reports to the Congress did not provide sufficient insight into cost, schedule, and progress. In addition, new programs were initiated without fully assessing alternatives or effective, effectively consulting with warfighters or stakeholders, such as the intelligence community. MDA was still able to develop and field a limited homeland and regional ballistic missile defense capability, but there were also program cancellations, delays, added costs, and gaps in knowledge about performance that could have been avoided using sounder approaches. In recent years, MDA has taken important steps to reduce acquisition risk. For example, it has improved oversight reporting, increased its outreach to stakeholders, and increased the accuracy of its models and simulations. Importantly, it has also taken steps to reduce concurrency. For example, full rate production was postponed until problems with the SM3 Block 1B were corrected. While these and other changes are significant, more can be done as illustrated with the recent cancellation of the RKV program. First, MDA can take additional actions to incorporate knowledge and perspectives of stakeholders. In the early stages of the RKV program, for example, Concerns raised by warfighters and independent experts about the design of the RKV went unheeded. In the end, the same design issues were the principal reasons for the program's cancellation. As it plans its next generation interceptor, we are seeing that MDA is taking actions to work better with stakeholders, and more broadly, it is assessing how to better engage the intelligence community. Second, as with the case with RKV, MDA still resorts to tests, reducing tests or adding concurrency when experiencing developmental delays or schedule pressures. Both practices tend to be harmful. One reduces knowledge about performance, the other increases the cost and time needed to deal with any performance problems that are discovered. The pressure to go fast has also resulted in entering contracts without finalizing their terms, which makes it more difficult to oversee contractor performance. We recognize the threats are real and the need to broaden missile defense capabilities is indeed urgent, but there are also other ways to help speed the process, such as on-ramping new technologies only when they are matured, developing additional suppliers so there's more competition and more alternatives, rigorously assessing the range of alternatives before initiating new programs, taking swift action to stop or redirect efforts when they are not working, 
and strengthening systems engineering capacity and the government's knowledge about a program's technical baselines. Such actions put the programs on a better footing, but they do require more resources and focus up front. Again, we see MDAs working on these challenges, but they will not be easy to overcome. We also recognize that Congress and DOD are looking at different facets of missile defense, including acquisition, the transfer of systems to the military services, and MDA oversight. These studies are important as MDA is at a pivotal crossroads, needing a balance its ability to pursue new missions while also maintaining its existing portfolio. We look forward to working with the agency as it addresses any recommendations from these studies, as well as our own, and moves forward with its new programs. Thank you, and also thank you to Sarah Miniaro for her support with GAO. I'm happy to answer any questions you have. Thank you very much. It's my understanding that the first series of votes will be about 1030, so I'm hoping we can conclude the public portion of this hearing by then. I am going to forego my uh, public questions and save most of my time for the closed session, but I would like to yield my time now to Ms. Stefanik. Thank you, Chairman Cooper. I appreciate you yielding your time. I also want to echo my colleagues' comments about Sarah Monero. Uh, you've been a tremendous asset to this committee, and uh, we are grateful for your service and wish you the best on your next steps. I wanted to start off by asking you, General O'Shaughnessy, with the cancellation of the RKV, coupled with emerging threats that we face, I would like your comments and assessment on the critical need for an East Coast missile defense to ensure that we do indeed have a layered defense, specifically the next gen generation interceptor. Yes, ma'am. Uh, thank you for the opportunity because I do think it's important that we do consider that we have to be able to respond to the threats. In other words, we don't, we don't own the timeline. Uh, our adversaries own the timeline in the sense that they, they develop capabilities and we have to maintain the ability to defend against them. I can tell you today I can defend against the rogue nation threats that are current, for example, in North Korea. I also have the ability with our current system to defend against, for example, in Iran if they were able to develop said capability. My biggest challenge uh, now going forward will be as we do look at NGI and the fall on versions thereof, uh, that we maintain that competitive advantage. Things that we need to consider. We have Fort Greeley, we have holes that have literally already been dug that we need to fill with capability uh, with the NGI. Following that, we would probably need to continue to assess the capacity as well as the geography uh, of where we think threats would be coming from. I think that assessment has, hap has been happening. Uh, the Continental Interceptor site work that's been done is certainly going to inform that uh, as we go forward to how do we maintain our ability to defend against these threats. And um, Mr. Sufer, I wanna go to you. Uh, as you know, um, it was Fort Drum has been released publicly by the Secretary of Defense as the preferred location for any potential East Coast missile defense. Is that your understanding? Uh, yes, it is, Congresswoman. Thank you. With that, I'm going to yield back to Mr. Cooper. Thank you. Mr. Turner. Thank you. Um, Admiral Hill, we were able to have a conversation yesterday <clears throat> about the canceled RKV and the opportunity to pick up time. Uh, could you tell me about that process? As you know, all of us on this committee have been very disappointed at the projection of the time period for uh, getting that program back on track, you know, I'm, I'm very fond of saying we put a person on the moon in a shorter period of time than we're being told that the RKV will be, be redesigned. Could you tell us of your efforts in, in that and um, um, g give us any hope that we might actually be able to have capability within a, 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 um, a what, what would be a reasonable time? Yes, sir. Uh, th thanks for the opportunity uh, to respond to, to the question. Uh, I, as I sit here, I feel the pressure of two warfighters on either side of me. Uh, and they've been very clear that the time and schedule is priority one. In fact, it is requirement one that was approved uh, by the JROC uh, this week. Uh, so what we've done is we've taken a holistic look at not just the development timelines, not just going to flight tests, but we've backed that into the evaluation of the bids. So once we release the request for proposal and we go into the evaluation period of the bids when those are delivered to the government, uh, within that process, we intend to have the warfighter as a part of that uh, effort. And to give you an example, normally what you would do in any competition, if one of the proposals does not meet one or several requirements, you would typically just dismiss that, that contractor from play. 
We're going to take a very close assessment, and if there's the inability to meet a requirement, let's just say instead of over by two points, you're under by two points, we, we don't want to remove that contract. We want to take an assessment to see if there's schedule that we can buy from not meeting that requirement. And then we will go to the warfighter who's participating in that process to get approval to adjust the requirements so that we can keep that contractor in play to buy that schedule. So that's one example within the evaluation process of the bids. So it's very important for me, one of my highest priorities right now working uh, with within the department is to get the request for proposal on the street so we can get bids on the table. You know, we mentioned before the 75% schedule, and, you know, that's that's just kind of lingo from our side on the acquisition world where you have a 50% confidence is what you normally go with. We want to really dig into the schedule, so we're at a 75%, which gives you that uh, 2028 time frame. We know that working with industry through the evaluation process, we can have opportunities to pull in schedule. So, so there's, there's the evaluation period. When you get into development, we have a series of knowledge points, we have a series of milestones as we track through each major event, and again, we're gonna keep the warfighter engaged. I'm very happy, even though the JROC is not an MDA process, that General Hyten has stepped in, he has told me personally, he wants to help. And the help of having the four-star level service chiefs engaged in how we're doing through a development is unusual, but I think it's necessary in order for us to capitalize on any schedule advantage we can get through the development, sir. Sorry, we're currently coming up on uh, the um, test of an SM3 Block 2A against an ICBM target. It's been somewhat controversial in this committee. Could you please describe how important this test is, what we intend to accomplish, and what you think the outcome might be? Uh, yes, sir. I, I, I agree that's a very important test. Uh, just so that we can understand what we see in ground testing and modeling and simulation, does that realize itself in an actual flight in the most uh, closely uh, operationally realistic uh, event that we can do. So we're going to launch the same target that was used during the successful FTG-11. That was a salvo shot with GMD. We're going to launch that target. We're calling it a simple ICBM because that was the con congressional direction to do a defensive Hawaii scenario. So defensive Hawaii, very important, but understanding how the SM-3 responds in that very stressing end game is going to be important data that you can't get from models or from ground testing. So we'll launch the ICBM. It'll fly through the field of view of the sensor coverage and then we'll fly that long range and we'll have the ship mission planning, putting herself in the proper position and uh, shoot uh, the SM-3. We have uh, two on site uh, that we're preparing, so we have a primary and a backup. So we've, we've brought in everything that we need to do to be successful in that test. The modeling and simulation shows us today that we're gonna have a very high PK, but it's gonna be very stressful on the front end of the missile because it wasn't designed to do this. So we're operating outside of the, de the design space, not just for the SM-3, but also for the Aegis combat system. But based on the analysis, we're very confident we're gonna succeed in that test, which is coming up uh, here soon. Um, General, the, um, um, General Carbler, the, um, we have uh, sustained casualties, uh, again, in Iraq from uh, rocket attacks. People have been very concerned about our lack of missile defense uh, that protects uh, our troops there. Could you please speak about what needs to be done to, uh, to provide some uh, type of uh, coverage uh, for our troops in Iraq? Yes, sir. Thanks, thanks for that question. It's I've been a career air defender for uh, 32 plus years uh, in defense of our four deployed forces and allies and assets is a critical priority. Um, as you know, there's a significant number of uh, air missile defense assets that are deployed to the CENTCOM AOR right now. And I do know uh, that General McKenzie is in the process of bringing those air missile defense uh, assets into, into Iraq. Um, the, the COCOMs, they, they determine the posture and how they will uh, employ their AMD assets. Uh, to best meet their intent and to minimize risk. Uh, we can also further minimize risk, uh, not just through active defense, but also through passive defense measures, such as the uh, early warning that was provided to our soldiers uh, in Iraq during the uh, Iranian launches uh, in January, as well as the hardening sites and dispersion. Um, I will tell you, uh, the PresBud 21 does provide uh, continued funding to uh, our critical air and missile defense capabilities, so Patriot indirect fire protection capability and uh, maneuver short-range air defense, uh, which gives us that multi-layered, multi-threat air and missile defense capability, again, to reduce the risk uh, to U.S. forces and our, and our allies. Um, we talk a lot about uh, countering UAS. Uh, the SecDef, uh, Secretary of Defense designated the Secretary of the Army as the DOD executive agent for uh, the Joint Counter-Small UAS Office, uh, headed up by Major General uh, Sean Ganey. 
they will look at developing the joint doctrine, requirements, training, and material solutions uh, to get after the current and emerging uh, small uh, UAS as, as part of the threat set. I yield back. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Carbajal. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, welcome to all of you today. Uh, Admiral Hill and um, Ms. Ch uh, Chaplin, uh, what steps are being taken to ensure that the next generation interceptor um, does not have the same fate as the GBI and the RKV? Uh, the GMD program has cost more than $40 billion, an enormous amount of money spent on the EKV program, which has produced a system with a very poor record the RKV program wasted $1.2 billion trying to fix the kill vehicle. Are you convinced uh, things will be different this time? And let me just say that this is my second term in Congress and I have sat on Hask uh, all of this time. It's very difficult to go back to my constituents and just continue to justify all that we allocate in the NDAA for the Department of Defense. When time and time again, uh, we have these wastes, we have systems that don't work, we don't have the checks and balances that correct the course, and quite frankly, I, I gotta tell you, it just, it's frustrating. I'm a Marine, and I want us to have the best national defense possible, but it sure is alarming and disconcerting when we have a waste of money uh, that consistently comes up in the DOD. And I, it, it's extremely difficult to go back to my constituents and yet again vote for another NDAA that we wanna make sure shores up our military readiness and our national defense. But this just happens time and time again and it's quite frankly for me, it's a broken record and so I'm very curious about your reactions. Sir, thank, thanks, thanks for the question. Um, I, I will tell you that I'm, I am laser focused on the fact that the country has invested and continues to support uh, uh, defense against uh, you know, long range uh, rogue threats. Uh, I remain concerned about that. The whole reason why we have a GMD system is to protect this country, to protect your backyard, protect my backyard, protect our children. Uh, I have high confidence in that, but uh, we, we can turn to the warfighter to, to get a confidence check from them. I look back at the data from FTG-11, and one of the newest missiles flying one of the oldest missiles, that was a dual salvo. To me, it, it builds a lot of confidence in today's uh, GMD fleet, uh, the Aegis fleet, strong, the, the THAAD fleet, strong, uh, what we do with Patriot and how we bring those all together and link them, uh, you know, whether it's regional and in the future for homeland defense. To me, I think, I think that's a very, uh, you know, good, good path to be on, uh, particularly against uh, today's threat and then where we're going. For FRANGI specifically, some things that we're doing different to, to um, and it may sound a little geekish to you, but it's very important that you get the requirements right. So we started there by working closely with the intelligence community. And I'll tell you, it's a little bit of a rough ride as you come through assessing what the threat would be and, and all the uncertainties. But based on our best knowledge and the best people sitting around the table, we set those threat requirements and, and we had those approved uh, through the JROC. The operators approved those requirements. So that's, that's very important to me. And then you look at the, the kind of contract approach that we're taking here. Uh, what we're gonna do is compete. So we're gonna have a, a competition uh, at the Olive Brown level. This is just not the kill vehicle, it's the Olive Brown level because it's so important that we address all technical and warfighting requirements at the Olive Brown level because it's operating within a larger system. We need to make sure that we've got the whole missile right. We are funded to take two contractors through preliminary design. And if there's enough resources in the program, we're gonna go all the way through critical design. And if I had it my way, we'd go all the way to flight testing and have ourselves a dual production line. Competition is key and then rigorous technical evaluation all the way through. So I think we've set this up uh, to do it right. We learned a lot, you know, as, as frustrated as I am and as you are with the RKV uh, program, we learned a lot from that and we are making sure that we've laid down the right requirements working with the warfighter, working with the threat community, and then getting into the development and the contract approach. Thank you, sir. Ms. Chaplin, thank you. So I would agree um, with the actions that he's already cited and, and would concur they're very positive. Um, we also see that uh, MDA is trying to make sure there's some key flight tests before they do go into production, which is a good sign. And they're also 
emphasizing early parts testing, which was an issue in the last program. Um, on the other hand, RKV itself started out with good intentions and good practices as a foundation, and it was just later in the program when things started going, um, when they started experiencing delays and problems, that they went back to some of these high-risk practices. So we're hopeful that things will be better. We're very encouraged by the interaction with stakeholders this time and the intention to get department-wide buy-in and to adopt some better acquisition practices, um, but still cautiously optimistic because we've seen other programs start out with good intentions too. Thank you. Mr. Chair, I yield back. Thank you. The gentleman's time has expired. Before we move to the next questioner, let me note that uh, Admiral Hill mentioned the term laser-focused in his oral reply, and General O'Shaughnessy had mentioned it twice in his written testimony. I would suggest that's an inappropriate term since the laser activities have been zeroed out of the NDAA budget this time. Um, Mr. Rogers. <laughs> that's why I like him. Dr. Sufer, uh, we've heard uh, General O'Shaughnessy and Admiral Hill both talk about uh, the importance, and you talk about the importance of this space-based uh, sensor for both ballistic and, and uh, hypersonic missiles. In the last NDAA, we instructed, Congress instructed that that development take place in the MDA. It was, as we understand, moved over to the Space Development Agency. And then in this year's uh, PB21, it says that it's transferred to SDA. Who's working on this sensor capability? Congressman, may, may I defer the answer to uh, Admiral Hill, who works closely with the Space Development Agency? And I'm all for it. Whoever can answer my question. Uh, sir, yeah, th thanks, thanks for the question. Um, and as you know, uh, MDA had been plussed up uh, over the years uh, to start the development and initiate the uh, hypersonic ballistic uh, tracking sensor system. Um, that uh, was always meant to uh, augment the systems we have today so we can handle the, uh, the evolution of the ballistic threat, DIM targets, and to track the unpredictable maneuvers globally uh, for the hypersonic threat. A uh, decision was made uh, during the budget formulation in PB21 to, to take those dollars out of the Missile Defense Agency and place, place them within the Space Development Agency. Who made that decision? Um, if Congress directed it to be done in MDA. Yes, sir. Uh, it, it was made within the department. Who made that decision? I believe it was recommended by uh, Dr. Griffin. He mentioned that recently in public. Uh, what he was trying to do, and, and I'm, uh, he, he's trying to consolidate the dollars for space because it's such an important capability that we need. And so by having it run by basically the architect for the proliferated uh, capability, uh, Dr. Tournier, as the director of SDA, uh, there, there's no light between us. We're working very, very close. What I do recognize as a concern for the Congress is visibility into how those dollars are leveraged and making sure that uh, MDA is in charge of building that sensor. There's been no no change in that strategy for MDA to remain the developer for that sensor and to provide that to SDA as part of their architecture. Well, I like Dr. Griffin, but he should come back to us and talk to us about that before the decision was made. So tell me now, who's doing the development? Is it you or SDA? It is the Missile Defense Agency for HBTSS as part of an SDA architecture. Okay. Uh, do you feel like you're making sub uh, substan substantial or significant progress? I think we are. Uh, we, uh, we, we've been very focused in first on, we did the AOA, we came through our uh, concepts of operations, we've worked very closely on what we consider to be the highest risk, which is you know, how do you deal with clutter, right? When you're, when you're looking down from space and you're trying to track things that are maneuvering globally, uh, that was the highest risk for us, remains uh, that highest risk, and we're moving towards a demo of what we call signal chain processing. So uh, we're on track. I want to go back to your last answer. I want to understand how you're doing the development of the space-based sensor, but the money's been moved to SBA. Yes, the intent is for SDA to provide funding back to MDA to continue the development work and provide those sensors to the SDA architecture. Okay. Uh, General Shaughnessy, uh, what is your requirement for a space-based sensor? Sir, we're very much uh, aligned uh, with Admiral Hill in, this, in the sense of urgency to be able to take advantage of all sensors, both uh, terrestrial sensors and then ultimately space-based sensors. Why I think that is so critical now is we see the advancement of things like hypersonic glide vehicles, where it's no longer uh, a trajectory flying in a ballistic manner that you can have a radar contact, a radar vector that then you can translate into the impact area. Uh, now with hypersonic glide vehicles, you need to maintain custody of that vehicle to be able to give the appropriate warnings 
uh, for our strategic command as well. And so to me, it's not just about using it from the defeat side, but it's also the warning side. And to me, the only way you're going to get that is with space-based sensors. Uh, in your best military judgment, do you believe that we have adequately funded or the presidential budget is adequately funding your requirement? So I would say we need to continue to invest in this uh, as it, um, critically important going forward. I think we have the initial funding, but I do think we need to maintain a focus on this because this is going to be key uh, going forward to our overall homeland defense design. I'll take that as a no. Uh, Admiral uh, Poland Aegis Ashore, what a nightmare that's turned into. Tell me the contractors eating the cost for these overruns and not the government. Sir, th thanks for asking that question. Uh, <laughs> I recently met with uh, General Semenite, and um, it, it was a tough meeting because we were looking for a way to get more predictability into that schedule. Uh, I will tell you, for as long as I've been on board, that's that's just been very hard to measure. You know, so when you have a construction contract that is a firm fixed price, and how you check to see that work is being done, it's it's not the way you would do it in a, in a another kind of a contracting scheme. And so we worked very closely with the Army Corps to say, let's let's go to do two things, and we've done this within the last two weeks. The Army Corps has refused uh, to offer payment to submittals that are coming in from the company today, from the construction uh, contractor. That's sending a message. In fact, their surety company is on site, so we know the message is being heard. We have prioritized very specific items within the contract now. We're no longer giving them the freedom to just go work on what they want to work on, right? That's not predictable. So we've said these are the priority areas that that support the Aegis combat system install and check-in. As you know, the Aegis system is boxed up in temperature-controlled temperature uh, boxes on site, ready to be installed. And so we're very impatient, and so we're working very close with the Army Corps to really leverage and pressurize the contractor. It could <coughs> move into the direction uh, where none of us really wants to be. Um, but for now, we're giving them a chance, but uh, it's kind of a carrot and stick approach. Here are the Thank priorities, you. and we're not going to pay you until you get those done. Thank you very much. I yield back. Yes, sir. Uh, now, Mr. Garamendi. The surety agent is at the site. Yes, sir, on, on ground doing an assessment uh, for the company. Which basically means what? What that means is they are preparing to either move out and complete as fast as they can or preparing for the government to terminate. That's what I thought it meant. In other words, deep, deep trouble. Correct? I would say that we have a go path. When the surety to arrives, there's trouble. Not always. I think this is actually a positive. The insurance sign. policy is about to be in place. Moving on. Um, I guess this goes to uh, Admiral Hill and Mr. Chaplin. Uh, Miss, what specific steps are being taken to make sure that the next generation interceptor does not follow the same problematic development process? that the GBI and RKV followed. The GMD program has cost more than $40 billion. Mr. Carbolo, I'm sorry, Mr. Carbolo, I should have been paying attention. Well, sorry. thank you very much. <laughs> Questions asked. I was reading ahead. My apologies. Well, sir, could I, could I ask to, to add just a little bit, because uh, Ms. Chaplin uh, spoke to it. Uh, flight testing and fly before you buy is really important, and I, and I ne neglected to, me to mention that before. Uh, within that plan, we intend... Uh, Mr. Garamende, uh, Russia uh, has, um, has made such comments. They hate U.S. missile defense. They've always hated missile defense, and they always will. I'll just say that that comment uh, represents uh, a bit of hypocrisy. Russia already deploys 68 ground-based interceptors, nuclear-tip interceptors. They have more interceptors protecting Moscow than we have protecting the United States. In addition, in addition, sir, they also <clears throat> field the S-400, and they're fielding, beginning to field the S-500, which has capabilities against ballistic missiles. So what I'm suggesting is, is that they already understand the value of missile defense. Now, the second way I would address that question is, we've, we've gone to great pains, both in the context of the uh, Aegis Ashore site in Europe and, uh, and potentially with a, the SM-3 2A underlay to point out to Russia that their missiles um, are just too technically sophisticated for us to address with the SM-3 2A missile. As to that information from theater. Uh, uh, back in January, uh, launched its missiles uh, into Iraq. 
uh, the Army, JTAGs, the Joint Tactical Ground Stations, those operators, they provided the direct downlink from satellites to that theater early warning architecture, and we were able to uh, immediately provide early warning to the soldiers and joint forces that were deployed uh, in Iraq to allow them to, uh, to take cover uh, and uh, thus reduce uh, uh, potential uh, killed in actions. Vice Admiral Hill, the Department of Defense will be developing several major defense systems over the next decade, including but not limited to the next generation interceptor, the ground-based strategic deterrent, and the W-93 warhead. Frankly, I'm worried that we'll soon outstrip our capacity for conducting the required testing on the designs and the components of these systems. In your opinion, where should we be investing today in order to avoid having the testing phase become a bottleneck for these programs? Uh, great, great question, and thank you for that. You know, par part of the NGI strategy is to work closely with industry uh, to strengthen the industrial base. Uh, Dr. Griffin has been pushing very hard for increased investment in the two areas that you're really asking about, and that is, you know, the parts that we require to operate in that environment, both from a natural environment and from a hostile environment. There are a limited number of those facilities that are available. So if, if I were to say what is the choke point or the long pole in this sort of development, again, a very complex weapon system, a very important weapon system, it is those test facilities. What should we be doing in order to help ensure that those test facilities are not a bottleneck? Uh, we should uh, continue to increase uh, our, our, our investment in those areas. And I'll just give you an example of, of one of them. Uh, the Michigan State University National Superconducting Cyclotron uh, is one of the key areas where we test for operating in the space environment, uh, and it's closing this year. Um, so that takes you down to a smaller number yeah, because the number's not that big, and I'll, I'll save that for the other session uh, to give you a sense of the numbers of sites that we can go to. So it's limited, and there is competition, as you mentioned. Uh, it'll be next-generation interceptor uh, parts and designs that are going through. It'll be the ground-based uh, strategic deterrent. <clears throat> I'm, I'm concerned about that. It is an industrial base issue. Uh, also, for Vice Admiral Hill, in your written testimony, you state that you, quote, anticipate the first next-generation interceptor round will be available to the warfighter as early as 2028, end quote. Given the expected threat environment, is there any optimism within the Missile Defense Agency or the Department of Defense at large to accelerate this timeline? Yes, sir. I, I think we have measures in place that will pull that in. You know, when you look at a government estimate, that is one thing. Um, need to get the request for proposal out on the streets, get the bids in by industry so we can evaluate. And I mentioned earlier, sir, before you got in, but it's an important thing to, to go back to. The evaluation process will include the warfighter. If we see something in a proposal that buys us time, I'm going right to General O'Shaughnessy saying that we need to lower that, that requirement to meet that, to keep that uh, industry partner in play. We want to take every opportunity throughout that evaluation process to buy time, and then once we get into development, we're going to take every opportunity to buy time. We already know by doing some smart things uh, in our qualification process and in the testing process that we can buy some time, but we won't know until we get bids on the table. Well, my questions were each directed at a particular person, but that meant that there are four others who may have opinions that they would like to share. If any of the other uh, panelists would like to share their insight with respect to any of those questions I've asked, please do so. General Shaughnessy. Thank you, sir. I'd like to highlight the work that's being done uh, right now and has been being done for uh, four or five months now with MDA. Uh, and that's specific to the question you mentioned about the time. It, and the, in the end, you can't just say, bang your spoon on the table and say, I want it sooner. You end up having to have a discussion about trade space and what is the trade space and what are the long poles that are driving this long acquisition timeline from a technology standpoint, and ultimately, how does that intersect with requirements? And so what I'm really pleased with was, is Admiral Hill and his team and his willingness to really roll up the sleeves with our warfighters to really have that discussion about trade space. What are the things that potentially we could relax a requirement that would give the timeline an ability to come left and you actually end up with a less risk in the in the end state because you actually get the capability sooner. And so it, it's a balance, it's a trade-off, it's trade space, it's working with industry, it's working with MDA. Those are discussions that we're having uh, and that's what we will have to have as we go continue on into the future. I see my time has expired. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, for uh, giving us extended period. Thank you, Mr. Moulton. Just a couple questions, and I'll defer to the, the classified uh, hearing. But, um, you know, if you look historically back to the 1980s with Star Wars, you can trace a lot of Russian missile developments to our development of missile defense. 
And I see a lot of nodding heads there. How do we break that cycle? Admiral Hill, you want to take a stab at that? Sure. I, <clears throat> it's sort of like the spy versus spy thing that I grew up uh, watching. Yeah. Um, yeah. So uh, we, we did learn a lot from the days of SDIO, and many of those technologies have been incorporated in the systems that we have today. Uh, I mentioned earlier about the close coordination uh, with the intelligence community. Ms. Chaplin brought that up. I, I read very carefully uh, the reports uh, coming from the GAO, and we're, we're taking those on. And one of the key things is, is having a close coupling with DIA, NASIC, MASIC, all, all the different intelligence community folks. And as we came through the threat assessment to present to Northcom, and Northcom did their own independent look at the intelligence. You know, that's when you that's when you you get out of this game of going back and forth. You have to project forward as far as you can without making it an unobtainium, but you, you need to project forward with the best people you've got in the country. And I think that we brought them all to the table and we developed a <coughs> solid set of requirements that'll ensure that when we put that first NGI in the ground out there in the late twenties that it's ready to perform and can be upgraded along the way through development and upgraded once it's in the ground to take on increasing threat sets. But, but my understanding is that our, from a strategic perspective, missile defense program is not designed to go after the Russian threat. That, that's, that's correct. We are our charters for the, for the rogue threat. But unfortunately, the rogue threat is increasing its capability. But you answered my question in terms of Russian modernization by saying that we're trying to... Oh, I'm sorry, I, I, was, I was talking about the modernization of the next generation interceptor in the GMD program, the U.S. defense side. My question is more fundamental. Are we just in a never-ending escalatory cycle because every time we develop more advanced missile defense, the Russians develop more advanced architecture? Let me, uh, since uh, Dr. Super... There's whispers from behind me that it's not true, but it is true. It absolutely is true. This is how it's gone. And at some point, it's just not strategically stable to be headed down this path. S sir, may I? Um, I? I'd like to take uh, take question with your with your assumption that uh, that uh, U.S. missile defenses have led to an expansion of Russian offensive, uh, uh, you know, action reaction type of phenomena. Well, you can take issue with that, but I've heard this from the Department of Defense. Well, let me give you an example, if I could, sir. So, uh, under the um, the Bush administration. The the second Bush administration. We pulled out of the ABM treaty, right? But we also initiated uh, a, a massive reduction in our offensive forces from 6,000 to about 2,200. There was no uh, arms buildup on behalf of, of the Russians. Even, even Ronald Reagan, when he announced his SCI program, we managed to get the START treaty, uh, uh, offensive reduction. So you've always had Missile defense and offensive reductions, they're not inconsistent. Yes, but they're all, they also don't necessarily go hand in hand. We got an offensive reduction because we pursued that treaty. That's not, that even, has nothing though, to do with the fact we that Russia is modernizing their defenses. forces to beat our missile defenses. Those are, those are the, they're not connected. We, we pursued both missile defense and offensive reductions. I understand we pursued them, and that's why we got both of them. Right. But that does not disprove the argument. There's just a logical disconnect here. That does not disprove the argument that if we're pursuing missile defense, Russia's modernizing its forces. And so we're in this never-ending escalatory cycle where the more that we pursue missile defense, no matter what we say about it being aimed for a rogue threat, Russia continues to modernize its forces. I, I would just say in response, Russia began its recent modernization of its nuclear forces well before we uh, began deploying our 44 gram base interceptors. When did they be begin that? They've been, they've been doing this for uh, probably at least 15 years. Exactly. It goes yeah. back to the SDI initiative in the 1980s. That's exactly where it goes back to. So I just want to understand from a strategic perspective here where this goes. Look, if you look at our budget request, sir, we are not planning a major expansion of our missile defenses. We have 44 ground-based interceptors. We're going to add 20 to 64. The Russians understand this. If the Russians understand this, then why does the defense minister say something quite different? Or the deputy to foreign minister, when he said that the planned test of an SM-32A against an ICBM can only mean one thing. The United States has started to develop a system that is to be used against us and to build up a potential that can, be, that can devalue the Russian means of... Sir, they do that to influence our allies and to influence our members of Congress. Okay, so explain that a little further since you're making a... We're having this exchange here. You're, you're, you're using a statement by a Russian uh, uh, foreign minister to, uh, to push back against our, our development of missile defenses. But, 
What does it matter to Russia if we can protect ourselves from a rogue missile? It, it doesn't affect exactly their right. nuclear exactly deterrent. Exactly right. You're exactly right, sir. And so they protest too loudly. They should not be protesting. We are protecting ourselves against North Korea. We made that clear in policy terms and in programmatic terms. That's obvious. Okay, fine. So I will just say that the intelligence community has testified to us that they disagree with you. It's more complicated than that, sir, and I uh, look forward to showing you uh, evidence on both sides of the issue. Well, I look forward to sharing some more evidence with you Thank as well. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Now, our honorary member, Mr. Lamborn. We all look forward to his appearance. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I was late getting here. I was in another HASC subcommittee until recently, um, a few minutes ago. So tell me if you've already answered this question. I don't want to duplicate anything. Uh, General O'Shaughnessy, it's always good to see you. Uh, being that you're in close proximity to U.S. Space Command, the former Air Force Space Command, which is um, temporarily based, hopefully permanently based in Colorado Springs near, near you, what are the synergies that you have in working together as two major uh, parts of our defense? Uh, well, clearly the decision hasn't uh, been fully made yet relative to the final basing of that. But what I can speak to is b both when it was Air Force Base Command mm -hmm. and then now as it's, uh, in, as you mentioned, temporarily uh, located there, uh, there is indeed uh, synergy. In fact, uh, General Raymond is literally my neighbor, uh, as well as our buildings are co-located next to each other. But we do find, especially with respect to the transitioning of the some of the, uh, the, the mission set from STRATCOM to Space Command as well, uh, as, as Space Command has stood up, that there's a synergy between the ballistic missile defense and those that are providing the sensor capability uh, in order to give the attack warning as well. And so our teams work closer together. There is a ge geographic uh, advantage there, but I will say um, that some of that was based on the Air Force Space Command being there uh, originally uh, as well. But I will say our, our teams are very, very tight. Excellent. Okay, thank you. Uh, General Carver, totally different subject. Uh, Iron Dome. Uh, in CENTCOM, are there opportunities to use Iron Dome, uh, which is a proven anti-missile technology that the Israelis developed and have produced uh, partly with our tax dollars that we could be taking more advantage of to protect our assets and our people? Sir, specific to uh, Iron Dome, uh, the Army will uh, field its uh, first two batteries here at the uh, end of the year. Uh, it'll take uh, some time for us to field those and uh, train up uh, the soldiers on those capabilities um, before we're certified to be able to, to deploy it. So in the, in the near term, I would say no, uh, not feasible yet. And we'll, we will have to do the assessment after we train up, uh, train up the soldiers on the Iron Dome systems when we get them. Uh, to, to the broader piece, Iron Dome is a standalone system, not easily integrated into, into um, what we see as our future for air missile defense of the integrated battle command system, which basically looks at any sensor uh, best shooter to deal with the threats that are out there. Iron Dome being standalone, I, I can't take those separate components of Iron Dome to allow me to, to, uh, to optimize our air missile defense posture. You, wait, what was that last statement? I didn't catch that. I, I can't take a separate component out of Iron Dome like the missile or the radar to be able to integrate into our, our broader integrated air and missile defense network to use, say, the Sentinel radar for Army Air Defense in the, in the um, Iron Dome missile using the Sentinel uh, radar data to be able to do that engagement. Uh, and that, that's why Iron Dome as a standalone system just uh, d does not fit in well for our future plans. Okay, uh, I, I hear what you're saying, but I don't want to see the perfect be the enemy of the good. I don't want to see a perfect hoped for and expected capability uh, deter us from using something that is available and usable right now and, and will save lives. Yes, Mr. sir. Lam and, and, and Mr. Lambert, would you yield for a moment? Yes. Earlier today, we discussed in the earlier committee the two lives that were lost in Iraq to Katusha missiles. Sp now, the Iron Dome is specifically designed for that missile. And it doesn't have to be integrated into your grand plan. If it, it's you know within what, 300 miles from that site where those two men died, the Iron Dome is deployed, could have been available, but you have a grand plan of some great integration system. 
Mr. Lambert, you're on to something important. Don't, don't give it up. OK, let's uh, have a chance to respond. Yes, sir. And, and General McKenzie right now is in the process of moving air and missile defense capabilities up into, into Iraq to uh, protect our soldiers. And what is the system? Uh, we'd have to go into the closed session and be able to talk about uh, what systems that we're going to move in there specifically. In And again, Iron Dome, uh, Iron Dome, as we fielded at the end of this year, we will look at its operational capability and make an assessment uh, for its deployability as well as its uh, 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 use in theater. I agree, it is a combat-proven system. Uh, the Israelis have shown it is a very capable system. It, it's, it's also a system that is used uh, within, within Israel. Uh, so again, we have to be able to look at how deployable is it, how, how well can we get it into theater and, and then operate it with the soldiers uh, given that it might not be as maneuverable as we might want it to be. Okay, thank you. I yield back. You know better. Mr. Turner. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just want to go back to Mr. Moulton's question and try to give some clarity as to how Russia's protestation that, that the United States missile defense is somehow the cause of their investment in what are new capable weapons uh, and, and new capabilities. On our new start, um, we're both limited to 1,550 warheads, 1,550. So Russia has 1,550 weapons, nuclear weapons, that are capable of hitting the United States. There are 40 um, ground-based missile defense missiles in Alaska. There are four in California, 44 to 1,550. So my question to the panel, is there any, um, do we have any capability in our missile defense system to even address the least capable of Russia's missiles, because that would, of course, suggest that, that they would need to, uh, to get greater capabilities if we're able to address their least capable. Is there anything with those 44 that we're actually able to do in addressing the least capable of Russia's 1,550 warheads that are capable of hitting the United States? And or do we have anything that's currently funded or that you are currently working on that will that is plan to be deployed that would address the threat of the 1,550 nuclear uh, warheads that Russia has capable of hitting the United States? Anyone? I mean, I believe the answer is no, right? I mean, so someone should should confirm for us that-, that I, I'll, I'll confirm, sir. Uh, it's you. outside of our charter to uh, design against uh, Russian and Chinese. There is a different strategy for dealing with Russia and China. And, and you don't have anything that is capable of, of addressing 1,550 nuclear warheads that the Russia has. The numbers and the capabilities, no. Uh, and, and there's nothing that, that you're developing, that nothing Missile Defense Agency has, nothing that's currently planned to be deployed. So they're least capable, meaning that they would have no need to seek additional capabilities, is still not addressed by what we have deployed or are, are planning on deploying through the Missile Defense Agency's work, correct, Admiral? That is correct. Okay, thank you. The committee will be in recess and reconvene almost immediately in 2337. It's my information that votes on the floor have been delayed, so there is a possibility we can conclude the closed session uh, fairly soon. Thanks.